Welcome to the After Dark Podcast with Anthony James and Conrad. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Hello and welcome to the After Dark Podcast. I'm Anthony James and that's Conrad. Hello. That's him. Well, this week we thought we'd take a foray into Game of Thrones. Why did we do this, Conrad? Now, it's a Saturday episode again. Now, I just want to say straight away, straight away, before we go do anything else, a few people in the comments of our last Saturday episode, which was, uh, uh, I'm sure it was tomorrow. The Edge of Tomorrow, which I'm sure was a big shock to some people. Uh, some people weren't happy at all. Uh, <laughs> let's just say, let's just <laughs> on say the that. internet. Yeah, on, on the internet, people unhappy. Oh, my God. Uh, and I would say un- they weren't happy. They, they were very, very cordial. But... Um, but there's someone, my favorite comment I think I've ever got ever got on YouTube is some, someone commented and said, why? Just why? <laughs> <laughs> listen, to, listen to the podcast, then you might know why. Um, but yeah, I, that was good fun. I enjoyed talking about something that wasn't dark. Um, so today we thought we'd do Game of Thrones. Now, I'm um, just a sort of, oh, I haven't even asked you how you've been this week, Conrad. How you been? Um, you have I've, to do that yeah. on the podcast, don't you? I, yeah, exactly. You've got to be a good host and yeah. um, you know welcome your guests. I'm not really a guest though, to be honest. No, I'm more host. like um, yeah, I'm more like um, a, kind of the permanent fixture that just stands in the back commenting on things. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I've been good though. Um, I, I'm trying to think what I've what I've actually done this week. Nothing. I literally have just been in my house doing very little. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm. Uh... You know, I'm still. My wife is going for a lot of naps while I'm while I'm here because I'm back at work now. So, uh, yep. you know, nap when she can because the new baby. But at the same time, uh, I'm also binging the Expanse as as quickly as I can. Uh, although I've finished season two now, so I need to do that review. So I need to make sure. So uh, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm watching the Expanse. I just love it. So um, yeah. So what we thought we'd do with this one? Oh, subscribe podcast app. Subscribe YouTube. Okay. So what we what we <laughs> What we thought we'd do with this one is now both of us, you know, we have went through, I, th- I think, our honeymoon phases with Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, neither of us are like sort of going to the subreddits and the refreshing to see if the new books coming out every every second. Uh, at this point, we used about, to be. At, yeah, we <laughs> yeah we used to be. So we're, we're, we're through the honeymoon phase, um, yeah. but it's still something that we do enjoy and it's something that we, we 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 do have a lot of views on. So we thought we'd sort of do a series of these podcasts with no upload schedule at all. But the first one we thought we'd do is uh, John John Snow. So we're going to look at John Snow's character. Um, why do you, why do we do that, Conrad? Um, because Kit Harrington gets those YouTube views going. He's <laughs> yeah. a hot property, Kit Harrington. Actually, yeah. I don't know if he really is anymore. To be honest, I feel I feel like the worm has turned a little bit on 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 Kit Harrington. There was definitely a point where everyone was like, "Let's get him in this in our movie," and now I don't mm. think he's really in movies anymore. Yeah, he's there's a new TV series out like a crime t- I don't even know what it's called that's how much that's how little I care about him but um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a new show out at the minute uh it's just come out on Netflix a second season of it it's like a crime show I- I've never even seen it I'm gonna be completely honest I've never watched anything with a minute except for Game of Thrones uh do you never watch was it Spooks no I saw a bit of Spooks I on- I don't honestly remember him being in it but apparently he was in that so and I I, I have definitely seen some of Spooks but yeah I I'd like- I think that's kind of the case for we won't get into this too much because this is supposed to be like a sort of character arc specific thing but I feel like pretty much everyone in Game of Thrones initially with the exception of probably Sean Bean I was like I Lean don't Bean. I've never seen you before I've seen Bean yeah Lynn, I've, Lynn I've, Hedy, I've seen like, Bean before Oh, I've seen Bean all the time for England, James. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was that, that's the the best Sean Bean role as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, like I think he, him and Lena Headey. Whereas, like, yeah, I think all the young people. I say young. I mean, they weren't that young. They were like, you know, eighteen, nineteen, or whatever. When when the first season started, they all kind of came out of nowhere for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And obviously, the children did too. Um, yeah. So yeah, he's not he's not a very big draw. But anyway. <laughs> Obviously, I think Jon Snow is going to be his sort of Magnus. Magnus. I keep saying this because of, because of Dark. So, <laughs> Magnus Opus. Magnus Opus, yeah. Because yeah. I, I said it on, in a video Magnus one time, Opus. and it was a complete slip. 
uh, but it, it's a great pun for dark. Doesn't work for this, obviously. So yeah, <laughs> magnum opus. <laughs> so uh, this will be his magnum opus. I think he won't ever do anything that's bigger than this. Uh, no, but he was, you know, he was a he's he's probably. So cards on the table with with a song of ice and fire as like a property. I really enjoy it, but I did start to sour a little bit on the reputation it had as kind of um, a narrative that deliberately sort of distanced itself from the traditional kind of chosen one narratives mm. of fantasy storytelling, because it definitely did do that for the first of course. three or four books. And then it very pointedly at a certain point stopped doing that and was like, ah, actually, no, this is the main character. Um, and, you know, that's not, not a criticism because mm. uh, or loads of fantasy series do that. You know, eventually you need to have a main character or a couple of main characters. And I think Jon Snow is that, is that main character. But it did, it did rub me the wrong way a little bit how much it kind of backpedaled on, um, on like the hype around it, which admittedly isn't the book's fault because the hype wasn't, you know, the book wasn't the one hyping itself as being yeah. this, this thing that, uh, that sort of disavowed itself of traditional narratives. Um, yeah, and, and in fact, I think when George R. R. Martin's interviewed, he always, he never states that himself. He would always talk no, about like, hero, he does, hero's yeah. arc and, you know. Yeah. But I think Jon Snow, it's not unreasonable to say that if the show has a, a hero, it's, pr it's probably him. Um, mm -hmm. it, no, I don't think I can't think of many other characters uh, who who can hold a candle to to his sort of longevity and importance to the to the main story. Yeah, exactly. And like for the people who are saying uh, in their mind right now, Daenerys, Daenerys. Well, yeah. You know, if 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 what the sh show did comes to pass, obviously it'll be much more fruit, uh, much much more fulfilling of the book, I'd imagine. But what if the show did comes to pass, then you'd imagine that she's just a really long grooming of a villain. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like she, she ultimately will become a villain. Um, Tyrion is probably the other one that I would say that's that, that he's pretty close to a pretty close to a hero, but he's not as he's not as tall and or oh, actually Kit Arrington isn't tall at all. But he is <laughs> like Tyrion is still shorter than and less pretty uh, than than Jon Snow. So like traditionally he, speaking, he, yeah, traditionally sure, yeah. So he has um, so he has more kind of main character properties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so we thought we'd segment this out a little bit. Uh, so we're going to start talking about Jon Snow, early Jon Snow, all the way back in season one, before he, before he, uh, before he goes to the Night's Watch, when he's a young, he's a young pup. <laughs> yeah, we did this. We did that, this accent before we started. Let's go. Yeah. But the thing Don't is, we, we, we're, 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 we're slagging off Kit Harrington's northern accent, not the northern accent itself. Oh no, I went. I I lived in Leeds for like seven years. I love the north of England, but it is yeah. But Kit Harrington's accent is very like, hello, I'm from the north. Or like kind of just <laughs> this awesome weird grommet. amalgamation, yeah, like of of northern accents without really trying to nail anything down. Yeah, there's no specific place. It's it is. Um, yeah. Okay. So he he starts off uh very quickly in the first episode and i think you've mentioned before that you felt this, the first episode of game of thrones is one of the best pilots you've ever seen yes. um because there's a lot of information a lot of characters really compelling uh john snow starts off uh, we, we find out very quickly that it's sort of a, to be honest with you when i first started watching game of thrones I, I i started watching it before i read the books and uh i'm one of them people and i i noticed that i think most of us are but i noticed that um for me there was a few things that were confusing at the very beginning. And that was to me was how's Jon Snow related and in, and how's Theon Greyjoy related? Cause in my yeah. mind at the very beginning of the book, I could, I, I was like, hang on. So is Jon Snow like a, a ward or is he, is he it's captive? Like, it was a bit confusing to me at the minute. Um, but, but we found out very quickly uh, about that as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it kind of, it sets him up as a character to keep your eye on because mm -hmm he has a he has more about him in the early stages or more like kind of fantasy tropes about him than a lot of the other stark children you know he's the kind of the outsider with the uh, dubious heritage mm -hmm. and caitlin stark really doesn't like him because he's a a bastard who you know reminds her of her husband's infidelity there's, yeah, there's a lot yeah. more like meat on the bone early on for Jon snow when you compare him to someone like rob stark who's just like i'm the oldest son um uh, yeah, Cat Catelyn, Catelyn really doesn't like him. <laughs> like it's yeah. some of those death stares. It's uh, it's 
absolutely crazy. You can imagine she's yeah, been doing withering. that. She's been she's been like staring at him like that for like 16, 17 years at the start of the story. <laughs> oh yeah, like it's and it would you'd get sick of it eventually. Um, and uh, yeah, like he he's he's a very sort of dour character. Um, yeah, which, and he's. Um, he seeks adventure as well, which is a big part of sort of a, a, a character who is going to become a hero. He he wants to join the Night's Watch. He wants his uncle Benjamin comes to visit, and he wants to join the Night's Watch. Um, so he, that's a big part of a hero as well. That, that they want to they want to adventure. They want to go sort of and even and even at that, it's even more because he he seeks adventure. But not only that, he seeks adventure to become a part of a um, a group of me, a group of men at a wall that protect the world. So he sort of he seeks to be a hero, you know. Yeah, and Overtly. he's very idealistic about it, um, which he, he will be, uh, as as his story goes on, he will be disabused of a lot of his sort of idealistic notions um, about the world um, in quite brutal ways. But, you know, it's good for him to start quite earnestly and sort of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to take on the world, and then slowly have have his his worldview irrever- irrevocably changed by the people he meets and the things he sees. Yeah, exactly. And if, if I was going to put one word on Jon Snow at the very beginning of the story, it would probably be naive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'd possibly... Uh, oh, well, I'd say Sansa is slightly more naive than him. I was going to say Jon mm-hmm. Snow is probably the most naive character in the whole show at the beginning, but I think Sansa has him, has him beat there. Um, but uh, but when, you're, when your nearest competition is like a 12-year-old girl who dreams of being a, a princess you know that you're not <laughs> you're not doing that well in the in the the grip on reality stakes yeah exactly um and one of the uh one of the first things that, that sort of starts to broaden his horizons in my opinion in 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 his in his narrative is uh when he meets Tyrion and uh, yeah. Tyrion chats to him and he says he has a great line where he says uh every every dwarf is a bastard in their father's eyes um, and I, I, I think that Jon Snow meeting Tyrion, I think, I think Jon Snow, and maybe all the other characters too, but we're meeting Jon Snow here. Maybe all the royal family coming to visit him, actually meeting these people that he's heard about after all these years and seeing that they are just flesh and flesh and blood. As you said, he was very idealistic. It probably actually already started broadening his horizons, making him think, oh, it actually is very grounded. You know, this Tyrion is just this dwarf getting drunk in front of me. You know, the person that he's heard about all these stories about. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and Jamie Lannister probably has the sort of knight in shining shining armor reputation, mm-hmm. um, you know, as the the like. Well, he's not Lord Commander of the King's Guard at this point, but he he is, you know, this kind of fabled warrior, and um, and then he turns up and just makes fun of Jon Snow for like never actually having used his sword to fight anyone, and um, and you know he says that all the people, like the brave men going off to join the Night's Watch, are all like rapists and criminals, and then sort of calls them, oh yeah, the, the quote unquote brave men of the Night's Watch, um, and so he yeah it, his his kind of. The, uh, hit the, the sort of bubble around Winterfell is punctured in the first episode and you immediately start seeing the characters within it uh, developing as they're forced to sort of interact with the with the outside world and, and John more than most I think I, I I mean we'll we'll probably come back to this a little bit later on but there's definitely comes a point where John's character does stop developing I think um, yeah. which is around about the time that I think the show's writing starts getting a bit bad but um, but the you know the, the, for the first four or five seasons there's a very definite and, and pronounced arc to his character and the way he sees things and the way he wants to interact with the world yeah yeah definitely I agree um, and in terms of in terms of how he, he, he begins we mentioned Catelyn and she is um she she doesn't you know doesn't like him <laughs> to, to put it mildly she's always, yeah. she, basically because he, he's not her tr- it's, it sort of reminds as you said reminds her of uh, Ned's infidelity and yeah. um, but so you'd imagine like so he's very cold doesn't really have a, doesn't seem to really have a relationship with Catelyn um, and he, and basically whenever they found the pups as well the the direwolf pups it, it's there's a big metaphor there that he gets the run to the litter the white one <laughs> yeah. You know, so very, very on the nose metaphor there. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of yeah, the that that part of the of the the story kind of wears its metaphor on its sleeve and is a bit like, do you get it? Like, here we go. Yeah. He gets the one that's a different color. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't mind stuff like that because die wolves are cool. So I'm prepared to give him some slack. Um, I, I'm going to ask you this now um, mm-hmm. as well, right? Un- his uncle Benjamin. We can get into the Night's Watch stuff in a minute. His uncle Benjamin 
did you think that was Timothy Dalton when you first saw, watched this <laughs> watch this series? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Oh, okay, I did. I was like, is that the guy <laughs> from Hot Fuzz? And then, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then went and checked, and they're not the same person. They don't well, even really look alike, to be honest. Well, I will say there is actually a actor who was in Hot Fuzz in Game of Thrones. I'm sure there's more than one. I'm trying the, to think which one you're talking about. The but... hound. The hound. Oh, of course, yeah, the hound is in it, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. I feel like there must be more than that. I've, I'm going to oh, yeah. try I, it. I, oh, yeah, there probably is. Like, definitely, definitely. Simon Pegg probably turned up at some point. Simon <laughs> Pegg and Nick Frost just no, that hanging was, out. That, that was Ed Sheeran. Oh, God. Don't even remind <laughs> me. Uh, we're sort of... Uh, uh, sort of at a stage now in, in John where he has like, he's got this pop, he's the white pop. But what I was going to mention about that was, so he, very metaphorically, they're showing that he's the outsider in the family. Having said that, his relationships with his siblings, especially Bran and Arya and even uh, Rob, but we see less, yeah. of, less of his relationship with Rob. Um, they are very strong and they are very sibling-like. Like they, they've grown up together. They are, they are brother and sisters. So it's, it, it's, Catelyn doesn't like him, but it seems that he has had a loving family upbringing. Yeah, and I think the the bonds between the Starks are really the heart of of the show, or not just of the show, of the narrative um, in general. That you're you're sort of you, you are grounded um, in your investment in these characters, and John is probably well, I guess by the like, as the story progresses, John is probably the one that you're expecting to be the most successful just because of kind of where his story is heading although yeah. where where they've left him in the books he's not doing too well but um yeah. but uh yeah and and it's the the way they realize these relationships is really important to that i think because it gives you a chance to get to know these characters and to come to empathize with them and their relationships with each other so his relationship with aria is obviously very sweet um gives her the and, sword needle yeah it gives a needle and um yeah even with rob who's a bit of a a bit of a boring character i, I always find with rob mm. but but there's there's enough there to to you know keep you keep you interested um in in what happens to them yeah exactly and and for in turn in rob's in rob's case as well he wasn't a point of view chapter, chapter uh, character in the book so maybe the fact that, that that suffered in terms of the writing of the show because they were showing him more more often than you see him in the book so therefore instead of just hearing about what he does we just see what he does but there's not really yeah. any character built in there um, no and like the, the problem the problem that rob has is is that he is positioned a lot, his character basically exists to act in opposition to the people you don't like after Ned Stark is killed. So, like, it's it's kind of like, oh, he's the one who's fighting Tywin Lannister, and he's the one who's fighting Joffrey, and and we want him to win because we don't like those characters rather yeah. than because we we actively like him. Um, which is, you know, he's not it, as it turns out, he's not actually a major character, um, mm. but he does get you know one of the big sort of oh my god moments of the series, um, which is probably says something about his character that the, the most the most notable thing about him is how he dies but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah he does get I, that moment doesn't he <laughs> yeah i suppose we should probably say this is going to be spoilers in this yeah, yeah, sorry I, guys yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's literally a, a, a podcast about the whole arc of john so it's, yeah there's going to be spoilers there's going to be spoilers um yeah yeah rob gets killed by uh yeah. by the lannisters he gets killed really badly as well yeah it's horrible well, uh, yeah, what, what I actually, well, while we're on that su subject, we're going to dot around here, I'm sure, just very briefly. Uh, I, th I, I think it's, at that point, they, they didn't even need to do this, but they made the, the, the Red Wedding in the show more brutal because they actually like had them stab his partner in the belly and kill the baby. Yeah, yeah, she wasn't even there in the books. Like, yeah. she just kind of disappears off into nothingness. But yeah, in the, they, they made it worse, which is, was horrific. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was horrific, yeah. Unbelievable. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of before he gets to the Night's Watch, I don't, I don't know if we have anything more to add there. There's, there's, to be honest with you, there's not much much time before he gets to the Night's Watch, I suppose. No, like, I mean, you know, he goes to the war with Tyrion, and yeah. Tyrion is, like, a skeptic, but I think Jon secretly quite likes him, even though he's very defensive about him insulting this sort of noble order of knights, <laughs> well, not knights, but of, of um, guardians of the realm that he's about to join. But, you know, T Tyrion, I think, is the first, um, the first sort of brush with reality John, is, um, uh, John has, and then, but then he's immediately kind of thrust up against 
uh, the reality of the Night's Watch when he he gets thrown into training and meets um, what's his name, Sir Alistair Thorne, who Thorne, is yeah. a real piece of shit. And um... yeah, he calls him <laughs> calls him Lord Snow all the time just to get to yeah. Him. But he does also meet Gren and Dolores Ed, who are two of my favorite characters in the entire show. So, oh, really? um, yeah, I love those. I like the Night's Watch in general is where you'll find some of the best characters in the show, I think, because because they're very, very like explicitly not super rich or super talented or, yeah. you know, wearing expensive armor. They're just dudes who had to go and do like fight, like serve at the wall because they got caught stealing bread or something. And so you, you get a real sense of like heroism from them when they actually do brave things. Yeah, you know, I would agree with you. Oh, I just remembered, uh, Conrad, we actually forgot. There's one important thing we missed before he joins the Night's Watch. Oh, yeah. And when, when he, last time he sees Ned, and Ned says, next oh, yeah. time we see each other, <laughs> I'll tell you about your mother. Yeah, that, was, that definitely wasn't like a, a, a sort of weighted sentence or anything. No, there's absolutely no meaning to be taken from that. Yeah. I, I mean, even like, so I was like you, I think when I read... I, I I watched the first season and then I went and read all the books, I think, between the first and second season. But even um even before that, like just watching at this point before I knew what was gonna happen to Ned Stark, he might as well have just walked off with a sign around his neck that that read, I'm about to die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it's so obvious. Yeah, the next time we see each other. <laughs> yeah. Hit by a train. Um, okay, so yeah, what, what you mentioned that he meets uh, Dol- Dolores Ed and, and uh, Gren as well. But when yeah. he gets to the Night's Watch, he also meets a, a young portly man by the name of Samuel Tarly. Good old now, Sam the Slayer. Sam the Slayer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in more ways than one. Uh, so Sam, yes. in my... <laughs> <laughs> so, Leave that where it, where it sits. Yeah, so I would say Sam to me, like, I always noted his name Samwell, Samwell, um, because Obviously, we have to draw comparisons to Sam Wise, you know, yeah. in, uh, in Lord of the Rings. So to me, I think the fact that he's called Samuel Tarly and, and you know, John has his Sam, just like Frodo had his Sam. Yeah. I, yeah. I th- and, and Sam Wise and Sam Well are actually very similar characters. And I feel, in some respects, I, I feel that this was very much uh, a, a way to show or get it into uh, people's minds that maybe from the start like john is the hero of this show there's so many characters in the show but this is the guy to watch and this is the guy that's going to do it in the end just like frodo did it in the end do you know what i mean yeah i think that there's definitely something to that um i think you know samwell is obviously perhaps not as recklessly brave as samwise gamji is mm-hmm. like samwise is just kind of like i'll have you long shanks and like threatening to punch a wizard or a nazgul or whatever i can't even I remember can what carry you <laughs> yeah um whereas uh, samuel is a bit more of a coward uh, well, yeah. well a coward in the beginning he beca- he finds his own bravery eventually mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but he he yeah he's a brilliant foil to john because to be honest he's sort of the opposite relationship between sam samwise and frodo actually because uh samwise is really brave and he sort of is spurring frodo on and then frodo sort of is like coming along with him and he goes with him whereas samwise is almost holding john back yeah but I, and I also i also think that that john is uh, john is quite he's not boring there is depth to john but he if john was on his own it would be a lot less interesting like he needs this cast of characters around him to allow there to be moments of of levity and to allow some humanity into into his story because it, mm-hmm. otherwise it would just it would just feel a bit like a kind of chosen one narrative um and and the, the night's watch being around john really really like let him explore that as a character um so yeah i mean i, I think in terms of where john's character goes i don't think there is a more important character um that sits alongside him than than samuel tarley to be honest yeah exactly definitely his his uh, buddy throughout the whole thing but um yeah, and I think it's important. The uh, like the the Night's Watch does have a real sense of brotherhood. I think that's something that the show did well, especially in the early seasons. This brotherhood and the the, the, the you know the varied cast of characters. You say it's much easier as a viewer um, of the show to to buy into them doing it for you know for the watch or you know for each other to defend the realm. If we actually do believe that the relationships between them is that strong, like they are brothers in arms, you know. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's kind of it has that vibe of um, almost like how I imagine 
prison to be like really where you have to make your little group of friends that look out for one another so mm -hmm. in their case it's, it's Gren, Dollar said Pip and um and Samuel and John um because as a, the the depiction of the Night's Watch is of sort of equally the, this this sort of group of close-knit friends but also of a an army that is made up of cutthroats and murderers and and rapists and yeah. uh, and you know you you see both sides of the night's watch pretty much equally um and mm -hmm. you can kind of see that that john is his character is is kind of forged in that dual crucible because as well as um learning to support others and you know help his friends he also learns to be pretty damn ruthless um when he needs to be yeah exactly and it's a good analogy there because it kind of literally is a prison you know oh uh, yeah yeah <laughs> you know so that's and, and it is as you say you know like i'm sure like John would have been wanted to stay away from the uh, from the ones who were in for more heinous crimes than the the fellows that he ended up hanging around with. But I can't actually remember if any of the, the his, his main group of friends. I, I I can't remember if any of them uh, what what the crimes that a few of them committed were. Like they were they weren't they they weren't like particularly heinous were they i can't no, I, don't, I don't think like pip is the only one i can remember and he he basically um shouted when a lord tried to touch him up and and was accused of stealing as a result mm -hmm. um i can't remember what gren and dollar said did but i'm pretty sure they didn't do anything too bad they weren't they they were there sort of by misfortune rather than because they deserved to be which yeah. is, is probably why john gravitated to them as as a group of friends um but you know turns out to be turns out to be a good choice because they are they they are an awesome set of characters who each get to do something pretty cool um in their own rights uh while they're while they're serving alongside john yeah, exactly. Uh, also, uh, it's interesting. John's uh, narrative, uh, like his his character arc in the in in this first sort of first season or two, very much he's very committed to the watch. He wants to be there, but any time that he gets some sort of news from the rest of the realm about his family being in trouble, uh, for example, when his dad gets imprisoned, uh, also I think whenever certain it's his, when his dad then gets beheaded, he is immediately trying to run away uh from from the wall to help um i yeah. think both times there he gets stopped by his mates and they you know wind his neck in there uh and, and they, um, they say no you can't leave because they'll literally kill you but <laughs> you know well I, th I think um one of the most important bits of dialogue i think that that oh one of the most important conversations that john ever has is and i, I think this happens that the listeners will have to correct me if i'm wrong but i think this happens when ned is killed and he wants to go south to get mm -hmm. revenge and he has a talk with master aemon um who it turns Eamon, out yeah. Is, mm -hmm. yeah it turns out is uh, aegon targaryen um about how you know he wanted to seek revenge when Eamon his family targaryen. no it's, it's, i think he's aegon isn't he because he changes his name, I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm, I might be wrong, but well, no, I'll I, call him Maester Aemon anyway. He's I, think, a, he's... I, I think the king that became the king because he refused it was Aegon, because that's that's Egg from the Duncan Egg. Uh, oh yeah, you, yeah, you might be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll call him Master Aemon, uh, Maester Aemon rather, because that, that I'm pretty sure that's that his name. right. That's it. Um, but but yeah, so he's talking about how you know he he has gone through this same thing where he his his uh, duty to the Night's Watch. Is te was tested against his duty to his his family, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's it, it's like it, it's it's basically holding up a mirror to the you know, John and how he treats his vows. Um, and that it, it, it's funny how that there's a there's a I don't know how you feel about about this actually because I felt like they got away from it quite a lot as the series went on. But there's a line from Caitlin Stark in I'm gonna say. I'm going to say it's the third season okay. where she says, um, where she's talking to Rob and she says, um, if you treat your vows recklessly, your subjects will do the same. And, um, mm. you know, the, the, the Starks are kind of held to this standard. Um, the, the that few way, other characters yeah. are held to. Yeah. Like, you know, you need to keep your vows. Um, and I, I feel like the, most other characters aren't held to that standard and don't really get punished for not doing it. But, um, which has it depends how you read it i guess like in john's case that makes him kind of a, an exemplar of, of of that virtue which is probably why people follow him mm -hmm. 
Um, although it does it does mean that it gets a bit annoying when the bad guys like continually break vows and don't seem to get punished for it. But uh, <laughs> that's just the, that's just the, the the that's the rule of the rule of life, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, this and this is kind of like before Caitlin Stark has even uh, uttered that line. Um, you know, John is having his vows tested and is being reminded by a character who I, I don't actually know the name of the actor who plays Mace Raymond, but um, but you know no, he's got an amazing amazing like gravitas to his performance and he's sort of reminding joe of his um, joe <laughs> joe snow <laughs> like john snow of his uh of his duty um which yeah i love that in the in the first i think it's the first season it might be the first or the or or the third it's either well, when, when he has the chat with guys. Eamon. oh yeah yeah it's, it's it's the first season yeah yeah okay yeah and um there's a development on the wall where benjen goes away uh ranging north of the wall uh, and he takes a couple of rangers with him, uh, and they don't come back. But uh, U- Uther, I think, or Otha, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I always thought Uther in my mind, but I'm pretty sure it's Otha. He yeah. comes, he comes back, but he's dead. Uh, and then he comes back to life, and then we learn that maybe these myths of the White Walkers and the Whites and the others maybe are true. Maybe is true. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of that's kind of the confirmation, I guess. Really, yeah. like you. Oh, well, we you see in in the opening, of, yeah, yeah, in the opening of the show. But yeah, for for the night's watch, especially for John, this really like no pun intended lights a fire under him, under him, <laughs> and he he really like from this point out in the show, his storyline really is centered around for the most part. Um, takes a little bit of a little little bit of a holiday over to Dragonstone a bit for a while uh, later on, but I suppose that's still still for the storyline. Um, so his his storyline very really does become you know these the winter is coming basically you know the words of the House Stark these White Walkers are coming and we need to we need to prepare we need to stop them that's that becomes his central like sort of driving force. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like and and you can kind of as soon as he's exposed to this sort of existential threat, you can kind of see his story laid out in front of him. Um, and I, th- I think for the most part, they do quite a smart job of doling it out in small amounts. So they, they kind of pull back the camera slowly on John. So at this point, it's all about him becoming uh, or being groomed for the leadership uh, of the Night's Watch by mm-hmm. becoming, um, uh, Mar- what's his name? The Lord Commander. It's a, he's a Mormon. I can't remember his first name. Gior. He's Jorah Mormont's dad. G- Gior. Gior. Yeah. G- oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so he's been groomed for, for leadership by him. Um, so is his his focus is on, you know, the Night's Watch and leading the Night's Watch against these these threats. Um above the uh, or beyond the wall Mm -hmm. but as as he learns more about them it becomes clear that the the night's watch ain't gonna do it so (laughs) but it's it's like it's a slow reveal and it's it's what well i I, there's i think it's the end of season two i don't know how you feel about this and this is jumping forward a little bit no no, you jump away i think you know I think it's the end of season two where they show like the massive army of the dead for the first time or is it the end of season three I think it's the end of season two. They they all walk past Sam behind a rock. Yeah, the bit where they walk and none past of them Sam. Look, look around. Yeah, none of them look at him. Which I was like, that's annoying. That doesn't make any sense. How Sam's managed to survive in that situation, <laughs> but also, like they they're kind of they they take such a long time to get to the, to get to the wall. Like they're sort of just they're just kind of wandering around in circles for eight years until until the good guys are ready for them um yeah that is very strange i always thought that like you know yeah it's like what are they doing like they you know we're, the the night's watch have come out from the wall and been back to the wall like seven or eight times in the length of time it's taken them to get the the, the army of the dead to get to the wall once um but it's <laughs> I, I felt like and, and i i don't I don't actually remember if if there is a scene which shows them in the books, but I felt like they showed that too early because it pulls back the camera completely on the Jon Snow narrative to be like, okay, yeah. this is what he's dealing with now, and we now know that he needs to abandon this Night's Watch business. He needs to, you know, the, the Night's Watch is now kind of irrelevant. He needs to get into the sort of proper Game of Thrones grand scale politics thing to get mm-hmm. people with armies of tens of thousands on his side. Um, 
which uh, yeah, I, I, that, I didn't that love that. Come, that doesn't come for another few seasons. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so it feels like he's kind of spinning his plates a little bit um, and dealing with really like low level stuff that you know isn't that important, um, which I, I thought was a bit of a flaw in, in, in the show. But um, certainly the early parts like we're talking about here where it's just him and Joe Mormont drinking wine and writing letters is uh is quite fun yeah and like i just want to say like i wish i, I, well, I don't know maybe i definitely don't wish actually but how funny would it be if like the prime minister of the uk was uh was groomed by having to change the bed sheets of the current prime minister <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should go back to that do you like the sort of divine right of kings and you just <laughs> we have to just teach Oh no! Can we not do it with Boris? Let's not start with Boris Johnson. Let's get like let's get someone else in first, and then we can start this. Yeah, yeah we'll start. We'll start the new the new process of you yeah. know the best changer of a bed can be the leader of the country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We have like a sort of set of twelve tasks uh, that you have to complete uh, c- complete in order to be the prime minister, and only when you've when like sort of a, the 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 tasks of Hercules, and once you've done those. <laughs> you're allowed to rule the country for four years. Yeah, that's okay. That's the plan. We'll do that next time. Uh, so uh, <laughs> he also gets given um, the Mormon family sword, uh, a Valerian still sword the, uh, called Longclaw. Yep. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like most of the Valerian still swords, at least in the show, were Chekhov's swords, Chekhov guns, which never came to fruition. Um, well, I mean, they, they do come to fruition in the sense that they all end up at Winterfell for the Battle of Winterfell. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's kind of all they're there for, is that they're, they're basically, once you figure out that, and, and admittedly, I can't claim to figure this out myself. I got this from when I was going on the sort of Game of Thrones subreddits um, when I was reading the books. But once you sort of figure out that the effect that Dragonglass has on whites and white walkers is yeah. the same effect that Valerian steel will have because mm-hmm. it's forged in a volcano in Valeria yeah. or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, once you figure that out, you can kind of see, all right, there's going to be a battle with the army of the dead at some point, And they're sort of scattering these swords about all the popular characters. And so they, they end up um, there to, to help fight the army of the dead. It is a bit of a giveaway as to who's going to survive until that point. Cause it's like, well, this person has this sword. So unless they give it to someone else, which I think maybe does happen once or twice. I can't remember. Yeah, but... like, um, well, Jamie gives us, gives part of ice, the uh, Stark house sword. They melt that down and make it into two swords. One's, yeah. one's called ice, which is given to Jamie Lannister and one's given to Joffrey. And I think that one's called widow's wake. Is it? Widow's Whale, I think. Widow's Whale, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jamie Joffrey gives... has a bunch of sword names, though. He's 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 a real twat for naming swords, Joffrey. <laughs> yeah. It's like but, uh, Heart Eater as well. Yeah, Heart Eater, yeah. But uh, Jamie gives the sword to Brienne of Tarth, so that's one of the. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it moves about. But what I mean about that is, like in the, in the final battle at Winterfell, obviously, is really jumping away. But I mean, in terms of the Chekhov's gun aspect, we didn't see one. We didn't see. Obviously, we did see at Hardhome. I think we saw. Uh, John's Valerian Steel killing a White Walker. So we did yes. see it there, but we didn't see we, that didn't happen in the Battle of Winterfell. So that's what I mean about it being a bit of a Chekhov's gun that didn't come to fruition. Well, I think it's it's also set up. I, this is one of the things that I think the show doesn't do a very good job about communicating. But my understanding is that you can't actually kill Whites without dragon glass or a valerian steel sword either like yeah. they'll sort of keep they'll keep coming after you they're not like zombies where you can kind of sever the spinal cord and they'll die they'll they'll sort of just keep they'll stay animated until you get them with a volcano mm-hmm. glass or, or valerian steel sword um so i think that's that's why they needed to be there but i do agree as well that they, they were they kind of they kind of don't do a lot with with the that we'll get into the battle of winterfell later i think yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that entire thing is it's it's the best part of that season i'm gonna say that ahead of time i think like it's the best episode of that season but it's such style over substance it's it's yeah it's 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 frustrating <laughs> right okay so we're gonna sort of we'll rocket ship through some more of the uh at, at, in the night's watch stuff because probably that is yeah. the biggest part of his arc 
But um, I want to sort of get on to his relationships with the wildlings. Um, so yeah. he, he goes undercover in the wildlings and he kills Corrin Halfhand at his request, it seems, because he, yeah. sort of, he makes a sacrifice to get John undercover. He meets Mance Raider, he goes undercover, and he sort of becomes ingratiated with the wildlings. Now, obviously, we know eventually he's asked to kill someone, a farmer, I think, south of the wall, and he refuses. Um, yeah. So he's out. But, but what did you find, what did you sort of take from this whole John undercover aspect of this? Um, I think his relationship with Grit, which we'll, we'll, we'll do more a little bit later on that when we get into mm -hmm. his sort of romantic endeavours. But I think his relationship with the grit and uh, Tormund is really the thing that keeps keeps this character arc going because those are both really really good characters that like are really well acted and really well written and they they get to have a lot of fun at John's expense because he's still kind of pretty stuffy and pretty pretty humorless at this point in the in the show and those characters are not um I also like Gareth from the office uh <laughs> showing up Mackenzie as a Crook. wog Mackenzie Crook. Bit, bit Mackenzie Crook yeah um showing I up actually as a I wog. actually have Mackenzie Crook's novel that he that he wrote uh signed copy my wife oh, got really? it for my birthday, yeah. What was what that about? It's just a children's fantasy book. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, there you go. Might yeah, be worth I, something one day. I, I've got it, though. No, I'm not, not, not selling that. Priceless. <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's good. His time with the Wildlings is, is, is fun. It's, it's, I think it's uh, the moment where he kind of comes to fully compromise his vows to the Night's Watch or realize that they're way too restrictive. Oh, yeah. Um, and you know that these these people aren't this kind of um, aren't as big a threat as the Night's Watch will paint them to be, um, which you know becomes really important later on for what he what he tries to do when he reforms the Night's Watch. Yeah, exactly, and and, and he, he it comes as well to his naivety. But the thing is, that's actually kind of like the naivety. Well, you could say naivety, but also bigotry, I suppose, on behalf of the people of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, so, like, they don't really know many wildlings, and when they do see wildlings, they usually just kill them. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, they the the most wildlings that they interact with are like um, Osha and her friends who yeah. you know kidnap or try to kidnap Bran. Um, you know, they they turn up, threaten people, probably steal some food, maybe burn down a couple mm -hmm. of farms or something like that, and then and then and then piss off back north of the wall. So you know, it's understandable that Northerners wouldn't like them. Um, but um, this is this is his worldview being expanded beyond like the sort of narrow mindedness of the sort of man versus man rivalries that, that the show is kind of, or well, the, the, the story in general is making a point of saying these are really pointless. Like there's a far, there's a far bigger mm -hmm. conflict um, coming and we need to put all these petty squabbles aside to deal with it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so in terms of this sort of season three area where he's sort of undercover, with the wildlings and he's getting to know Ygritte and she steals his sword, I think, and runs into the, to the cave, uh, dot, dot, yeah. dot. Um, I think, uh, uh, what did you make? I, I, I was really, I, I love the, the episode where they climbed the wall. That was terrifying to me. Uh, I, like, you know, if I was John and I was undercover and they were like, yeah, see that wall there? We're just going to climb that now. I was like, I'd be like, right, I'm off yeah. back to the night's watch here. I, I've got a key. Yeah. <laughs> I, I the they sort of shot themselves in the foot with the the design of the wall to be honest because it's so <laughs> massive it's like how the hell would you this is a sheer cliff face you're just like climbing straight up for like an hour to get the, get to the top of it um but yeah it, it, it's I, I wouldn't have climbed it I'd have just been like oh, yeah I'm, I'm part of the night's watch just do what do what you want with me I'm not yeah. climbing that I, I probably to be honest with you I couldn't climb that <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. I, I would definitely just be running, but um, yeah. Um, okay, so eventually, then he he sort of his his cover is blown because he refuses to kill the farmer, and Egret yep. uh, actually fires three arrows in him, and then he returns back to Castle Black. Um, yeah, like she's definitely trying to kill him. Yeah, she's definitely <laughs> trying to kill him. Yeah. I've heard the argument that like, oh, you know, she was was aiming to kill. It's like you don't shoot someone with three arrows, <laughs> like if you're not trying to kill them. Yeah, I, like to be honest with you. Yeah, if she really didn't want to kill him, yeah, she wouldn't be firing arrows. Like it's so easy to accidentally kill someone. Oh, but hang on, she's so skilled with a bow. No, you don't shoot someone with an arrow. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, like I could, I could, like if she shot him with one in like the shoulder, I could understand, I could accept the excuse that she's not actually trying to kill him. But she shot him three times. Like she was definitely trying to kill him. Definitely, definitely trying to kill him. Uh, so basically, then in season four, as we go sort of through this 
this bit here. Um, I think season four is the episode where we get the uh, there's an episode episode nine of season four. I think is where we get the big battle. Uh, at battle of the wall, the, yeah. The watchers on the wall, yeah. And that's whenever the uh, wildlings come and sort of invade Castle Black. I think the wildlings they've got their heads screwed on. It seems they want to get south of the wall because they know what's coming. Um, and uh, they've united they've united under the king Mansfreda, and they attack the wall. What did you find? I, I really love this episode in it's like sort of in a it's like the whole thing takes place at the wall. Um, I remember it's like the first time they really did anything like that in the show. Um, and I just personally, I love this episode when I first saw it. Uh, I haven't actually watched it again since. I don't know how if it holds up, but it's, it was really good, I think. So, um, so I, I, I think I've mentioned on the, on the main show, but I have watched game well rewatched game of thrones quite recently with my partner because she had never seen it before. Um, and this is still a really good episode. I maintain that, the wall as I, I'm re I really try not to be like this when I watch sort of fantasy or sci-fi because you know you can pick holes in the logistics of lots of things and it who really cares but the 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 wall the way they've designed the wall is such that as a defensive structure it just doesn't make any sense because like you, you you wouldn't be able to fire an arrow from the top of it and have <laughs> no. any hope of hitting what you're aiming at no, no. and then they've got the big like ice scythe that like swings down it's like who the hell resets that once that's been set off like do you get like a team of eagles to sort of fly that back up to where it was before but it's it's it, there's a lot of very cool spectacle in this episode and i think the most important thing about this episode is the character work so you get to see john and alice thorne kind of arrive at a level of mutual understanding that you know they can work together because their backs are against the wall for tonight and then go back to hating each other um once once this is done uh you get gren being told to go and die in the tunnel and him just doing it which is to, to me probably one of the most heroic moments of any character in the entire show really that it's yeah. like yeah the, the, the king of the giants is coming through that tunnel uh, you can, you and four guys need to go in there and stop it, and you can't let him through. And they're just like, "Yep, fine, let's do it." Um, yeah, it's probably. Which, I, I'd say the only moment that rivals it is probably hold the door. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, hold, hold the door. But actually, when when he says that, I can't remember very well having se even having seen it recently. Is he commanding him to do it while wagged into him? I can't remember. Um. So he is. He is. Yeah, warged into him. Actually, yes. Actually, so he's being fought. So he's so not actually doing it. Yeah. So that. So I take that back. That's the complete opposite yeah, of bravery. That's, that's not. That's the. Yeah. That's cowardice from Bran. Yeah. 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 Like, Sorry, Hodor. Um. Yeah. Although I, I say that, I'm sure Hodor would have done it of his own volition. He would have. Anyway. Like, he he's a brave, a brave giant. But um. Yeah. I love Gren in this episode, and I and you know it's it's John making the hard decisions here this is kind of setting him up for where he'll go in season four when he becomes the lord commander um because he's literally sending one of his best friends off to die um and you know he does it without thinking uh which is, and, and he can also delegate command because when janna slint is ruining things down uh, at what the bottom terrible, of the wall terrible the battle, terrible man yeah janna slint i hate is, him he he is up there as one of the characters who is just like he really needed to die and i was very happy when he did um but uh yeah, yeah but and yeah. you know he delegates command to dolorous heads on top of the wall for them to fire their arrows at absolutely nothing and um, <laughs> and then uh and then uh he goes down to relieve Jana slint of command yeah uh so as you said there he does become lord commander um now i remember reading these chapters in the book and uh the actual the process of all the votes uh George R. 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 Martin goes into so much detail about the, yeah, the, the rounds yeah, like, of voting and everything. His his t like typical George R. R. Martin kind of detail and things that really don't need that much detail. I appreciate that he does them, but it's like for God's sake, man! Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is why your books take eight years to write because you do stuff like this. Let me just de design a whole new version of voting here. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so he becomes Lord Commander. He he sort of he sort of ascends to his uh, leadership role. Um, for the most part, I thought he was doing a pretty good job, but uh, not everyone agreed. Um, yeah, some people disagreed. <laughs> yeah, so he was using his. He was. He was actually quite. He was a very empathetic uh, leader. He was. He. He wanted to give the um, the wild the wildlings uh, a place. Oh, hang on, hang on. We 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 completely missed the the, the fact that Stannis came and Deus Ex Machina the uh, 
yeah, Stannis just turned up and was like, "Yeah, I'm here." And then, and then, yeah, yeah won the, won the battle with a bunch of men that he shouldn't have had because they all died at the Battle of the Blackwater. But whatever. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the importance of that is to John is that now Melisandre is about, um, yes, and Melisandre starts taking an interest in him, and she sort of all almost she seems to be second guessing whether or not Stannis is the chosen one. Maybe she thinks now that John will be. Well, that's what I was getting from it anyway. So, Andy, I'm going to ask you a question here, uh-huh. and you have to you have to answer it honestly. When Melisandre turned up, like, so you'd re- read the books, you 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 had read up to the end of the books before this stuff sort of happened in the show, right? Yes, yes, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So when Melisandre turned up at the wall in the books, did you suspect that that John was coming back when he eventually uh, he eventually bites the dust? Um. Well, obviously, in, in the books now, he's not back yet. Um, no, he's still dead in the books. So that'd be so funny if he never comes back. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> like George, George R. Martin's just like, nope, he's dead. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he will come back. Now, that's something actually that I that um, I want to talk about because he obviously he gets killed by his own men, which we can talk, yeah. we can talk about that that in a minute. But um, when he's dead at the end of the fifth book, like I, I do I did think he was I, I, Melisandre being there, obviously. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's that's the that's kind of the 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 ticking clock. There is like you you we know what the Lord of Light's magic can do, and mm-hmm. she's there. And and the way he dies, where I, I you know I I very much subscribe to the rule of unless you really explicitly see someone die, they're not dead. And um, the way his chapter kind of ends, it 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 leaves it ambiguous enough that it felt like there was some wiggle room on him coming back. Yeah, and also like uh, there's some really cool like theories about how he could come back and stuff. And like in in people who haven't read the books might not know this, but mo- a lot of the Stark children have warg abilities. Oh um, yeah, I know where you're going with this. Go yeah. on, carry on. Yeah, and a lot of people uh, they have a theory and they believe that John's like consciousness uh, tr- is going to be alive in Ghost because he warg. Yeah wall in the moment before he died and That'd like that, so can, cool. that, that can happen because like Mackenzie crook uh gareth from the office he oral i think <laughs> his name is he did end up just being a bird so he yeah wa- that, what happened with that like i i watched it again like not to completely derail us but he moments before he dies he just walks into a bird the bird attacks john and then he just flies off yeah so he's he's a bird he's just, just he's just a bird now <laughs> Yeah, he's just a bird. Uh, he's just an angry bird, north of the wall. <laughs> yeah. So north some some people somewhere. think that uh, John never actually died because he's now living in Ghost's body. Which, to be honest with you, I love I love that as a theory because the fact that the dog's called Ghost, mm. that's pretty pretty. Uh, you know, I don't think what that's about how if they um, in bringing him back, they didn't actually bring John back because John had wagged into Ghost and they sort of brought some demon back from the other side who pretended they, to be John for the rest of the series. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think that, um, to be honest with you, I, I, I like that theory because obviously the dog's name's Ghost and it sort of really kind of works well in a fantasy setting. Having said that, we've been shown that the Lord of Light can bring people back from the dead for a reason. Yeah. Like and there's that, not, they, they, they've know. not, they've not established that with, um, with, um, oh, what's his name? Um, Aurel. No, the, the the guy gets brought back from the dead. I've completely forgotten his name. Oh yeah, yeah, the uh, Lightning Lord, uh, yeah. Beric Dondarrion. Beric Dondarrion, that's it. Yeah, um, yeah. Like we we haven't been showing that just you know for a laugh. Like they established that because because someone important is coming back. Um, yeah. Can you can you imagine how bad it would be at the start of book six or halfway through book six or whatever? <laughs> If yeah, John, like, by John, the way, John comes back because of Melisandre's magic, but we, but the Lightning Lord didn't exist, and we never knew that was a that was a thing. Yeah. That would be terrible. <laughs> yeah. like, by the way, this magic happens. Sorry, we should have probably <laughs> got to that earlier. Exactly. All right, so he do, he does get killed by his own men, and the, yeah, I I was really sad watching it to be honest with you because his heart was in the right place. He he, yeah. he these these the the people who kill him are basically saying. No, you should just let the wildlings die. Yeah. Um, and I don't agree with that. No, it's, I mean, I do yeah, not agree it, with that. <laughs> he's, um, I think it's telling that the people who betray him are 
for the most part either people who are kind of lifers in the night's watch and kind of of the old school or are people who have had personal loss um from uh dealing with with the um with the wildlings so um is it ollie oh the guy? love ollie little ollie <laughs> <laughs> he's the, the one who the one who strikes the killing blow um, oh my god the little nod after when he when he when 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 he when he killed egret yeah his, his, yeah, little, his, his little nod no, don't worry about it boss i've got it covered <laughs> so, yeah. cheers ollie um that actually the the like o- ollie is yeah like he, he's probably the most interesting out of those characters because sir alice of thorn it's like we, we always knew he was a twat like he, he was always going to do something like that it was only yeah. a matter of time whereas ollie you kind of you can definitely see his reasoning for doing it um oh and actually i don't know if you remember this is completely out of left field but the the sort of um promo for this episode had uh benjamin stark in in the um like in it so it was like the first time he'd been mentioned i think in like four seasons because benjamin stark it became like a running joke during the show that he like disappeared at the end of of the first episode i think and then just wasn't wasn't mentioned again for like five years episode three or four i think yeah but it was yeah never mentioned again yeah but it just was never mentioned again and then in the in the promo material for this episode benjamin stark was in it and everyone was like oh my god benjamin stark's coming back and it was all a massive bait and switch because when john is is murdered by his men they they come and get him and say oh we found something of your uncle's and you know it's a sign that says traitor and they stab him and it completely got me and i'd read the book so i knew he was going to die but like it's still <laughs> i thought they were going to change it a little bit but uh yeah so they completely got me with that but yeah ollie is the ollie is the mastermind behind uh <laughs> behind john snow getting assassinated all right okay and i think with Jon snow getting assassinated that ends our Jon snow in the night's watch section definitely yeah <laughs> now, and now his watch has ended yeah so now he, he, he's technically no longer in the night's watch because he he is dead so when he comes back in the show um he sort of immediately sort of off he goes to help stannis in winterfell um and yeah. we, we'll sort of touch we'll only touch on a few few points on this but um i wanted to touch on the battle of the bastards because the battle of the bastards is in my opinion, one of the best TV battles ever. Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's that there's there's one bit of it which I don't like, which is the very beginning um, because oh, the running. Well, the running not so much, but the the way like the cavalry kind of saves his ass by charging into the cavalry that's coming to run him down. Yeah, because yeah. because horses don't just run into each other like they they run between they're not stupid they're not like that yeah, yeah, that yeah. thing is another horse with a big pointy stick in front of it i'm gonna run around that rather than into it i think <laughs> but um it was it was kind of that, that that is like the only moment in the battle where i was a bit like that was a bit silly and it was done for spectacle rather than mm-hmm. for something that would make sense but the rest of it is absolutely amazing and you can tell how good it is as well because a lot of stuff not just television but film has stolen a lot of the ideas from the battle of the bastards so uh if, the idea for anyone being who has... caught underneath yeah yeah that's that sort of um air, the really famous um aerial shot of the massive crush as yeah. they've been surrounded um is literally shot for shot stolen by uh the king the timothy chalamet uh sort of mm-hmm. uh henry the henry the fifth um movie that's i think still on netflix i think it's um, a netflix but, film so yeah, I think it is a Netflix film. Yeah, but it's um, it, it, so th- there are things that are taking inspiration from the Battle of the, the Bastards, which should tell you all you need to know about how influential it is as a depiction of of a medieval battle. Yeah, that no, was great, and I love like these sort of. I love whenever Game of Thrones one or two times it does this in the later series. I love when it sort of. And that's what, before I say this. Well, one thing I'll say about the later series: the writing goes downhill, but the production quality is always at a high so like yeah you start, it like, actually goes up i think to it, be honest it does go up because they sort of really start focusing on that rather yeah. than yeah, yeah. you know so i i love the bit in battle of the bastards where it sort of comes out and you're sort of in a third person view of john kind of yeah. like a video game and you're just following him around for a while the big sort of one shot of him just like staggering around a muddy battlefield as people just die it, it reminded me a bit of um obviously it's not the same kind of thing but it reminded me a bit of the opening of saving private ryan to be honest because it's just yeah. like chaos going on all around him as he tries to sort of negotiate this battlefield yeah yeah that's that's yeah good point um okay so we're sort of moving on through quite quite nicely now um so we got to the point where he is now fully involved in the politics of the realm they've retaken winterfell and um 
now there's a whole discussion about who should be the leader. Yep. Um, and yeah, we, and uh, this is actually probably probably the best interstark drama that we've had. I mean, the Starks haven't really seen each other for like six seasons at this point, but um, probably the best interstark drama we get in the entire show because we've seen Sansa go off on her own arc where she's gone from being a kind of a, like you know a little girl who dreams of being a princess to mm. one of the most competent characters in uh, uh, certainly one of the most cynical but also one of the most competent characters in the whole show and john has gone on his arc to become like the sort of leader of men and a hero and seeing those two come back together and be like well which one of us is going to run things because we could both do it um is is really interesting yeah definitely um so i would pick sansa personally i i would too to be honest with you and to be honest with you it kind of it, it didn't annoy me, but I but I kind of didn't like that he was the ki- he became the king in the north. I, I don't know. I I don't know why. Obviously, it, it, it works for his character because that he is the you know he's the he's the main character. Like he's he's on this arc, he's on this leadership arc, um, and like you know he's king of the north. But I was thinking to myself, well, but Sansa, you know, it, like John isn't true born. He's not, also not legitimized. And I know, I know it's like the, the way they cho- choose a king in the North in terms of like, you know, oh, we're going to support this guy now because there's no real set up uh, royalty at the minute. It, yeah. it sort of is a bit, it's a bit silly even arguing about that because they could choose who they want. But, um, but I still was, I still was thinking like, well, she's the lady of Winterfell now. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I kind of would have liked, and eventually, obviously we know she eventually does become queen in the North, but I would have, I would have liked her to get the the props straight away. To be honest with you. So, did you because like I have my own thoughts about this. Did, did you feel that they'd spent enough time on the whole politics of who's going to run Winterfell? Uh, no, I think I think I thought it was very quick into just King in the North, King in the North. Yeah, uh, it wasn't it wasn't very much at all. <laughs> So I think what for me one of the big criticisms a lot of people have of the last sort of two or three seasons of Game of Thrones is how rushed it feels, um, and for me the Battle of the Bastards is is really really cool to watch and obviously it has one of the sort of bi- biggest moments of positive catharsis in the whole show when Ramsay Bolton finally gets what's coming to him, mm-hmm. but I think that masks the fact that the show has already started to slip into this spectacle over substance kind of writing where they don't actually yeah. have that much story to work with so they're kind of rushing through because yeah there, there's so much that could be got out of the tension between john and sansa and you know delaying him being made king of the north because of him being a bastard and dragging out hit, uh, the revelation that he's actually a targaryen whereas mm-hmm. i feel like i feel like we go from battle of the bastards is over to oh, there's some tension to John's the king of the north to, oh, actually, John's not the king of the north because he's a Targaryen yeah. in the space of, like, 10 episodes of television, which it, it like, it, it doesn't... I know that probably sounds like a lot when I say it because it's, like, a season of television, but it really... It feels like they could have done with at least double that amount to really flesh out what what was going on there. Yeah, and there's a reason why, when you look back at the first few seasons, you view them as having better writing. And yeah. Because it's an objective fact that they do... But also, it's that they spent, like, if you were to go through the four things you just listed there that happened in 10 episodes, maybe even six or seven episodes, to be honest, the yeah. four things you listed there, if you were to do the same thing in season one, you would, like, say, like, choose Ned or choose John, you'd get nowhere near listing anywhere near more than one or two huge things like yeah. that. Like, season one, John uh, joins the Night's Watch, discovers the Whites. Probably that's all yeah. you could do in terms of big things like that. Um, and this is seven or eight episodes and you've got all those big four things comes back to life let's add that in too you know yeah yeah that's true yeah it's just yeah that you can kind of see they're already rushing through stuff at this point and it's um it, it, it i still really liked this the this season which i think it's season five with the battle of the bastards season five or season six um uh, season six I, yeah so i think this is the last really good season i think season five is terrible because that's the one with all the dawn stuff um dawn but we yeah we're not gonna get into the sand vipers i hope <laughs> but uh god they're awful but yeah the um the, the like season six is the last really good um season and the, there is still some really good stuff with john in it but they are i think you can tell that the wheels are kind of threatening to come off a little bit on um on the story yeah 
Um, so we'll sort of, I think what we'll do now is we'll talk about his relationships before we get into sort of the final, the final season. So very quickly, let's go over. He first of all has a, his first love of his life is Ygritte. Um, yeah. We've already sort of talked, talked about her, how he, he sort of betrayed his oath to the, to, the, to the Night's Watch by hooking up with her in a little cave. Yeah. Um, he then gets shot by three arrows by her. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then a little kid that he took into the Night's Watch kills her. So it, it, was, yeah. a bit of, it was a bit of a roller coaster relationship. We'll say that for it. I, I think this is, yeah, this is like peak Jon Snow in this relationship, I think, for me. Just because, and in many ways, I think that this is the kind of, that this is the kind of thing he will come back to. Like, the end of his character arc is very much him picking up where he left off with, obviously not with Igrit, but with someone who could potentially make him feel the way Igrit makes him feel, where he wants to just be free and not have to deal with, like, the troubles of, you know, politics and all that mm-hmm. stuff um and i think she she's so so brilliantly played as as a character um probably more so than than amelia clark um playing daenerys i think she is fine and like good in some spots but um i think i'm trying to remember the actress i think it's rose leslie who plays yeah. Igret. It's, it's actually his real wife in real life now Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, but so they they just have such great chemistry, um, and she's she has this like perfect mixture of kind of free spiritedness and also like kind of thinly veiled aggression and and danger, um, which which yeah I really like and um, yeah so I would be I would always be on team Egret. Yeah, um, I, I think yeah I think Egret was a better match for him, uh, definitely. Uh, it, you know it's the first love of your life you know so uh yeah. i think that i think it's definitely in this world uh because she was sort of taken from him i suppose in a way even though she would probably have killed him she was sort of taken from him um it's like if you lose a partner to to death young in your life i don't know if they'll ever match up uh yeah. anyone later on although having said that luckily i don't have to really uh i don't have that i don't have the personal experience of that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> luckily but um when when she does uh when she does die i don't like I think I, I don't know if you remember it this way, but you're talking my about Egret, or you're talking about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll qualify that by saying we're talking about Egret. I'm not, I'm not like privy to some information about your wife that I haven't revealed to you. Um, the um, yeah, no Egret. Like when she when she dies in the books, I think it's like I think it's like two chapters after. Um, uh, it's either two chapters after the Red Wedding or two chapters mm. after. Um, uh, the Red Probably. Viper um, has died. I can't remember. It's one of those two, okay. but I had to... I, there's basically like this one-two punch of deaths that are really significant. And mm-hmm. I had to put the book down for like a week after it happened because I was really upset with Igrit dying. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move into Danny then. What are you... Now, I think the word rushed comes to mind when I think about the, the relationship between John and Danny, to be honest with yeah. you. Um, yeah. Rushed and forced, possibly, as well. Yeah, um, they're just, there's no... There's no there's no spark between them really. Like I don't understand why they fall in love with each other. I don't believe that they fell in love with each other, I guess is a better way of saying it. The smolder Conrad, the smolder. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, yeah. When you consider how long they spend with Daenerys as a character and like Marine, just dealing with the internal politics of trying to deal with slavery, mm-hmm. like which, you know, there are criticisms of that. It's not, perfectly done and there you know there's some there's some kind of white savior issues with the writing of it as well that isn't isn't great but it it, but it's still you know they're spending a lot of time really diving into that stuff which is commendable no matter how good a job they do with it and then you look at how her relationship with john is just like right here we go they've met six episodes later they're in love with each other and it's i don't know i believe her relationship with uh dario naharis to me was a lot more believable than her relationship with john i would agree with that i think however dario naharis always annoyed me yeah and that's just because the actor changed (laughs) yeah i i really liked the first actor they found for dario naharis and i didn't like the second one as much yeah like so uh, to be honest with you it really t- like when the actor changed it really tainted my my pr- impression that's one of my biggest bugbears in film if i'm complete film and tv i'm completely honest with you uh when well, they're re- changing yeah so that like ooh, that's the only negative i have about the dark knight <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, <laughs> so as a film on its own it's fine because yeah but as a trilogy i'm like yeah but katie holmes what are you doing like you know 
Well, <laughs> I suppose Maggie Gyllenhaal should have got it in the first first film. That that would be the best case scenario. But um, yeah, that annoys me. But uh, so Darren Harris, I never really got into him because of that, to be honest with you. But um, yeah. Okay. Also, the mountain changed a few times, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, look forward to our Game of Thrones episode next week where we talk about the mountain who went through like four <laughs> character changes or four actor changes yeah, before yeah. they yeah. settled on one. Uh, podcast episode may not exist. Um, <laughs> 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 they go, well, can you imagine trying to do one on the mountain? It'd be like season one, he kills a horse. Season no, he seven. Had a, no, he had a... Did, didn't he? Yeah, he, he he was sort of like had a standoff with his brother. That's some substance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a he has a sword fight with his. He kills a horse. Has a sword fight with his brother. Season two, he sits in Harren Hall for a bit. Scene missing. Go to season seven. Like, like all, all of all of a sudden, he's a massive muscle bound freak. Yeah. <laughs> squeezes, just... squeezes a head. There we go. We've done the yeah. podcast. Done. We'll upload that separately. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh okay so um all right so let's get into the final season then uh yeah so you said the battle of winterfell is your favorite part of the final season yes i mean it's there's not much to choose from like i I, again i'm gonna put my cards on the table i'm not the kind of person who gets sort of pissed off about bad um seasons of things but i thought that the it starts pretty well this season you know i really like the episode before the battle of winterfell with all the characters kind of sitting around reflecting on the fact that a lot of them are going to die um tomorrow and Mm -hmm. you know that just taking that time to kind of breathe and let everyone reflect on how far they've come before before this seismic clash and the way the battle of winterfell is presented i think is is brilliant um I love some of the visuals of, um, you know, the the um, Dothraki riding off with flaming swords into into the darkness and the the flames like going out as they're mm-hmm. basically consumed by by the um, by the the army of the dead. But I think ultimately, both in terms of like what actually happens at the Battle of Winterfell and also what the major characters get to do, it's there's a lot of style over substance here. It's like here's a battle. It's a cool battle, but does anything really important happen here beyond, you know, are you killing the Night King? Like, not really. It's it's just, you know, the 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 North having its army, or the North and Daenerys having their army decimated by this battle, doesn't really seem to be addressed. It's just yeah. sort of like, yeah, we're gonna kind of gloss over that, um, and and yeah, that it's 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 a shame that they don't have enough time. I, it's not really the series' fault because I understand they didn't really they didn't have the actors for as long as they wanted to have them for, but it's a, it's a shame they didn't have more time to really do a proper season of this, I think. But I still think the the, the, the Battle of Winterfell is the best episode in this season. Yeah, but also my, my cynical, my real cynical head uh, is like, you know, David and Dan, the creators, really wanted to go and make Star Wars films. <laughs> and then six months, <laughs> six months later, because of how badly Game of Thrones the final season was received, they actually lost that contract as well. So, what what were they going to go and make? I didn't know that they oh, got. They, I think they they were uh, they had a contract with uh, Star Wars. They were going to develop a new trilogy. <clears throat> oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's and, and, interesting. And uh, and in all the discussions. Like it, it's not even official news, but everyone just assumes. I, I, I maybe maybe it is official news, but everyone just assumes that um, that there would have been like ten seasons of Game of Thrones. It's just that they they were trying to wrap it up as quick as they could because they wanted to go <laughs> and <laughs> make to get Star Disney Wars. on the phone. Yeah, and that so when they then when it actually finished, they went to make the Star Wars films, and then Disney were like, yeah, no. <laughs> So yeah, they, ru- I mean, they rushed it for no reason. But also, they they also they've, they've also been quoted as saying Game of Thrones was a great learning experience. Well, that's good. I'm glad they learned yeah. something from it. I don't so, know what they learned. I think they said it was like it was like university or something. That's it. That's their uh, that's their quote. Like it was something like it was great. It felt like like it was really good. Like university it taught us how to make shows. You know, like before this, they they, they clearly hadn't really done <laughs> something this huge before. But um, yeah. So let's well, let's. Uh, here's, I've got a question for you for a sec. Like okay, yeah. so talking about the Battle of Winterfell, right? Yeah, yeah. What does what does John do at the Battle of Winterfell? <laughs> John hides behind a rock. Yep. Has a dragon breathe at him for a bit. He flies around the dragon, and then he goes down. And then he goes, "Hey, you, Night King!" The Night King looks at him <laughs> and then walks away. And then he goes yep. up into this is the character that, from the very <laughs> beginning, has been being built up as the person who's warning the the realm that they're coming. 
He's he's fought a few of them. He's killed one of them in hard home, and and at the end of this, he just hides behind a rock, and he's actually killed two of them at this point because he kills another one um, when they go to get the whites uh, from north of the wall. Yes, actually, you're right. So, so he, they, he he has killed two White Walkers at this point, more than any two. other living, well, more than probably any human living or dead, to be honest. Like, if you wanted to, like, like, let's just get right into this, right? If you wanted to have Arya kill the Night King, right? I maybe, I may, I, obviously I can't say it, but I maybe would have been okay with it. If John had a huge battle with the Night King, like he was fighting for like two or three minutes with the Night King, and the Night King got the better of him. So like all of this time, all of this work was for like, you know, John failed. He couldn't do it. And then his, yeah. his little sister who he, he was, who let's be honest, was under his wing during their childhood. It, it, you know, she looked up to him and then she is the one who did it. She sort of saved his bacon, so to speak, you know? Yeah. But, but that's not how it went down at all. It went down that John just couldn't even, he didn't do anything. The Night, well, so, King, so, the Night King even just looked at him. The Night, the Night King didn't view John as, his, as, a, as, as, his, as a threat. He, yeah. The Night King, even though the Night King is who he is, right? And he, and he obviously has bigger fish to fry than Jon Snow. He should have wanted to kill Jon Snow because of what Jon Snow has done to him. He should, so, have, he should have wanted yeah. to engage Jon Snow in battle, in my opinion. I, so, like, I mean, I mean I, we have slightly different opinions on this, I think, because I what well, only slightly. So I, I don't mind Arya being the one to kill the Night King because I think Arya is cool. And I, thought I, it was, in, I think she's cool too. But yeah, no, and I think most people would agree mm-hmm. that Arya is a pretty cool character. And in my head, I think that's how um, the the creators viewed it. Like uh, Arya is a cool character. She's like a little ninja at this point. Yeah. So let's have her do some cool ninja stuff and kill the Night King when he's about to kill Bran. And I feel like... That is what they th- thought. That's exactly what they thought. Yeah, and, and and I think for John, they 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 thought, look, he is the hero, quote unquote, as far as there is a hero in this series. But he's not this sort of legendary swordsman. Uh, you know, he would get his ass kicked if he went up against um, the Night King in reality. And they just decided to not have that conflict, I guess. So I, I mean, I don't. In theory, I don't mind. Arya being the one to kill him, I think I was cool. What I do have a problem with, though, is that Jon Snow is sort of billed as the saviour of Winterfell, and he spends most of the episode not really doing anything important. Um, mm-hmm. Which, if if there were other characters doing really important things, uh, or, or, you know, dying heroically, or if there were other characters doing anything other than wheel spinning, I would probably be fine with it but it's just the problem with the battle of winterfell is as i've said before it's all style over substance like who are the meaningful characters who die there are none no one meaningful dies what mm-hmm. beric dondarrion and jorah die so this this like horrific clash between a like hopelessly outnumbered army and this army of the dead who can also resurrect all the people they kill once they've killed them and two of the main characters die like it, it, it just it, you know. Oh well, I'm Theon. Sorry, I forgot about. It. Like Theon is probably the one who actually gets like a good death. Yeah. Um, but and and so it's just when when you it, it's sort of a death by a thousand cuts. I think really this it's sort of you could get away with Arya just being like getting to kill him because she's cool. You could get away like get away with John not really doing very much of any importance if if you were doing like the legwork on the rest of it. But unfortunately. There's just no substance to any of it. It's just a bunch of characters being filmed in a corner fighting skeletons for an hour while like the Night King slowly walks towards Bran and then Arya turns up and stabs him with a dagger and then it's like da 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 Yeah, <laughs> and then, I know, yeah. Never it again. Yeah, and like in terms of Arya killing the Night King, like don't get me wrong, when it happened, like the the, the it's out of nowhere. Like obviously I'm gonna have a reaction. I think I think Arya's got a cool character. I like Arya as a character. Um, I think she's well trained and all this sort of thing. But the thing is, the reason why for me it really just it it it's it's bad writing for me because yeah, it's cool. Okay, it's cool. But in my opinion, Jon Snow's whole build was just thrown away, and I and I and I know one hundred percent the reason it was thrown away because they were like, we can't have him kill the Night King and Daenerys. Yeah, you know, we have but, to give another yeah. character a moment. You know. You know, it's like, uh, I, I, that's, that's what I, I, and I just, 
Uh, to me, I think George R. R. Martin briefed them on what the end of the story is going to be. I think he gave them an ending for Arya. And I think David and Dan said, well, we're not going to have time for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so her story didn't have an ending. So they just gave her one. And it didn't make any sense to me at all. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll maybe at some point we'll do an Arya one because Arya's ending is, is like, oh, I have thoughts on her ending. <laughs> Just what, like, going I'm going to go to Win- <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to go to Winter uh, to the uh, King's Landing for some reason. Oh, and, geez, then, yeah. and, and, and then okay. after that, I'm going to become an explorer for some reason. It's yeah. so like. <laughs> Like, good God, the leaps in logic they required to get that character where it needed to be just to do the, the sort of point of view shots in in uh, in King's Landing. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think... Oh, actually, actually, before we leave that, this isn't the Arya thing, and we will touch on this more, but and I'm not even going to... I don't want to elaborate on this in, in any way, Conrad, because I do want to do an Arya one one day, Like, but uh, I think uh, the, 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 the Killing the Night King deserved... Now, this is actually... I, I just remember, this is my biggest problem with it, right? Killing the Night King deserved to be the end of a character's arc. If John killed the Night King, that would have been the end of his arc. It wasn't the end of his arc because he didn't kill him. But she, they gave it to Arya because it was a cool idea. But killing the Night King wasn't the end of her arc. The end of her arc was when she, when, when she realized in King's Landing, I don't want to be the Hound. And then she decided, yeah. okay, I'm going to let go all of this revenge plots. It's all going to go away. That was the end of her arc. So she just killed the Night King because it was cool. And the Night King didn't serve the narrative purpose to a character that it should have. That's, that's my yeah, big deal uh, with it. I think, I think that's fair enough. It's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just a frustrating end to what is a pretty engaging, but ultimately pretty shallow episode of television, I think. <laughs> Okay, so let's then motor on through. We're, we're, sort of getting, <laughs> we're getting quite long now. So the last thing we'll talk about um, before we just touch on where he ends up, we'll talk about the fact that he does kill Daenerys. Like we're, yes. not even, we're not even touch on what Daenerys does because we can do that in Daenerys episode. But the fact that he kills Daenerys, um, yeah. would you have done it? <laughs> would you have killed Hitler? Not even baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just straight. I mean, yeah, you want to talk about characters of being similar to Hitler, the like oh, rows yeah. and rows of uh, of like all black, like uh, black clad soldiers with like flags that look suspiciously like Nazi flags hanging next to the ruins. Yeah, uh, the, 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 ruin. the dragons all intertwined do look like a bit like a swastika, and they're yeah, literally exactly, hanging yeah. the massive flag. Like I, I just thought oh, myself, it's, it's a it's a Lenny Riefen like a Lenny Riefen style was like the sort of uh, the the filmmaker of the Nazis, and it's definitely pulling from from her films. Of, of like the 30s and 40s in the depiction of like the unsullied and daenerys's army yeah and like the size of that flag yeah where did they get that from where, where did they get that from? that is that's, that's what i want to know but yeah so uh john sort of has a chat with Tyrion, and they sort of come Tyrion sort of talks him around away from like being so loyal to daenerys because he's so loyal to her you know he is loyal he's he's loyal to a fault is john yeah. and uh, i think not only did Daenerys take his attention away from the, the part of the story it should, Daenerys also stole his character arc because the, the end of his character arc is viewed now as when he kills Daenerys. But that's a story that's only been gone for two series, really. But um, So he kills Daenerys. Um, the dragon's not too happy about it. Blames the chair, of course. Um, what did you find? What, 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 do you have any thoughts about him killing Daenerys? I, I, think, I think there's a way to do it well. I think with with how the show did it and i i really don't want to be like backseat screenwriter for this but with what they had what i would have done is go up to the point where you have the standoff between like john and the northmen and the lannisters who are surrendering and mm-hmm. then daenerys um daenerys starts burning the city down i would have had john uh withdraw with his soldiers and have daenerys kind of go down with the city so she gets like cornered or something like that by Mm -hmm. by civilians and and is ultimately murdered or or dies in the battle rather than have her kind of win and be killed by him i i i don't know if that would have been much better but it just there's there's not enough time for anyone to come round on the idea of killing Daenerys and and they they had yeah. to realize that yeah like it, it, it was like, literally like what 10 minutes yeah it's like well yeah I mean it's like two episodes between Varys suggesting it and being burned alive because Tyrion 
yeah. dobs him in and Tyrion being like we have to do this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like and and you know convincing John that it's the only way and again you know I don't want to I I really like Game of Thrones I don't, I don't want this episode to come across as like oh Game of Thrones is terrible like it's not it's a really good uh, like series it just doesn't end very well and uh, uh, this is like a really big example yeah. of why it doesn't end well because they must have looked at this and be like we just don't have the time to tell the story this way so we have to change the way we're going to tell the story but they decided not to and the mm -hmm. end result is john just being like i love you but i've got to stab you and then <laughs> and then drogon burns a throne because it has a, a firm grasp on the idea of visual metaphor <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Who um, knew? yeah and then just to complete it uh Jon Snow, as all, uh, you know, the hero's journey, as we talked about in last week's uh, Edge of Tomorrow, the hero's yep. journey, he returns back to a familiar place. He returns back to the wall, yep. having changed. Returns home, one might say. Yeah. Oh. It's home away from home. Oh, yeah. Actually, he returns to the wall, but he, I, think, I think it is implying that he's actually going north of the wall. He's going oh, yeah. He, he's, he's going north of the wall with Tormund, who is easily my favorite character in the show, I think. Um, because he's the one that the there, there's a bunch of great characters in the show, but by the end of it, a lot of them have been really badly diluted or, or kind of undermined by some of the writing decisions. Whereas Tormund is just kind of off doing his own cool thing. Um, so yeah, John hooking back up with Tormund and Ghost and just heading north of the wall for some adventures mm. is is a, is a, a really good end to that character's arc. I have to say, like it's it's very yeah, yeah it's very, I like, yeah, it's I like that 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 happened. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's a shame how he got there it's a shit it's like yeah i think like the first 80 90 percent of the arc is great maybe 90 to 95 isn't the best in my yeah. opinion and then the last five percent yeah i think i think he ends up where he should end up i don't think he should have i don't think john snow should be the king um i don't i i think it's i don't know if i don't know if brand should be the king either however <laughs> I, th I think if that happens in the book, it'll be much more earned because, to be honest with you, in the show, Bran wasn't around for like three series. Yeah, Bran, Bran being the king is a lot. I just laughed when they nominated Bran because I was like, <laughs> that just feels like the the sort of decision that no one could possibly like have a problem with. So it's just just like electing a king. Well, it's literally electing a king a king by democracy, which I guess is a good thing, but it's kind of like. You're you're getting someone who no one is going to love or care for in the slightest. It's just Such like, a good story, though, Conrad. <laughs> yeah, he's our story. He's a storyteller. He's our history. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, well, there you go. There's Jon Snow. I think we've wrapped that up in a nice, neat little package. Um, yep. So, uh, if there's any other characters you'd like us to to cover, let us know. Um, uh, I'm sure we both Conrad and I have our other favorite characters who we'd like to cover. For myself, definitely Arya is one of the ones I'd like to cover. Um, maybe, Dude, maybe Jamie Lannister. Yeah, yeah, that's your favorite character. I know that. Yeah, um, I love Jamie. Ja yeah, Jamie's a great character. I and sure. Another one that doesn't end very well. He's not treated very well by the by the conclusion of his arc, but uh, mm -hmm. but most of it's very good. Yeah, and that's gonna that's gonna be a theme of these, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. To be honest with you, my favorite character is is Ned. I I, I think I you know <laughs> what? Yeah, I love Ned. <laughs> love him. I mean, I, do, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love Sean Bean. I love him in most things he's in. But like Ned is, you have to turn up pretty early to the show to to catch Ned before <laughs> before yeah. he screws off. One thing I'll say about Ned, he got out of the game before the writing turned. That's all I'll say. That's true. Yeah, he 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 got out while the getting was good. Ned, yeah. he was like, you know, I've got I've got all the all the good lines. Don't worry about me. Yeah. See, younger version of Ed, uh, Ned. Uh, I don't care about him. In, in the flashback, uh, I don't really care about him. We didn't really even talk about the fact that he's Aegon Targaryen. But anyway, we don't have time for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who, who cares? It's, the show doesn't. It's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the show doesn't care, so we don't care. But uh, he's a Targaryen for the length of time it takes him to ride a dragon once, yeah. and then for and then for Daenerys to be like, "Oh no, he's a threat to my throne," and then she dies. Yeah, so you know, all good that was. Like, the, yeah. the, there was no, there was no need for it. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks very much for listening. Um, if you want us to do another one, as I say, leave it in the comments. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure you uh, subscribe on audio apps. Um, apart from that, we'll see you on Monday. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the After Dark Podcast. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode.